Richard Bergen. He's also written The Man with Missing Parts. And he collaborated in this book, it's fiction, with J.M. Alonso. He founded and published the Boston Arts Review, and he's now in the process of establishing the New York Arts Review. And he's writing a biography of art collector Robert Skull. Welcome, Richard. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Which will we start with? You're, you've done so many things in your, and let's start with the New York Arts Review. Okay. The Boston Arts Review was a very, uh, you had very prestigious uh, introduction, the first copy. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little about it and what your plans are? You move, I know you moved it to New York, but you plan to keep the same format more or less, don't you? Uh, with some slight changes. Um, I felt that of all magazines in tabloid form, that there wasn't one that was really doing what I had in mind. What, in which Archibald. was? In other words, most of them were specialty magazines, such as fiction, which publishes fiction, or poetry, well that's a quarterly, which publishes exclusively poetry. Or I suppose the best known the most influential of reviews, New York Review of Books, right. is essentially a proliferation of book reviews uh, mixed in with some political essays. But there was nothing in Boston or in New York that really addressed itself to the full scope of creative endeavor. In other, in other words... Um, Covering all the arts. Yeah. Not merely uh, reviewing all the arts, but giving equal space and therefore equal commitment to uh, creative uh, work. Right. By that in, in the magazine itself. Right. Fiction, poetry. Now in the Boston Arts Review you have mm -hmm. a, a, uh, an essay by Leonard Bernstein. Uh, well that was actually a symposium on uh, Tanglewood in general and Kusevitsky in particular. Bernstein was one of the people who participated in it. And what else? Of, who else did you have in the issue? Uh, well, in that Just same to show the caliber of it. Yeah, in the same uh, symposium with Bernstein, it was Aaron Copeland, a well-known American composer, of course. Seiji Ozawa, who is, who is conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra in San Francisco. Noam Chomsky uh, contributed an essay on language and learning, because he's a very uh, distinguished linguist. And there was poetry by Jorge Guillén, a very well-known Spanish poet. John Ashbery, who most uh, Everybody readers knows. in New York <laughs> know about. Um, David Shapiro, very uh, exciting younger poet. Uh, Maxine Kuhlman, who recently won a National Book Award. So I hope to continue. So this is the caliber of the magazine. Yeah, but this doesn't mean um, that one would have to be famous to publish in the magazine, of course not. And uh, I doubt that there will be such a compilation again of uh, those kind well, of figures and names. And, uh, I don't certainly a launching to... pad as far as... Mm -hmm. So what are you striving for now in this? The, the same caliber at least, oh, perhaps not as uh, famous. Yes, well and also it's... I'd like to make it a little less academic. Uh, and it would be uh, a New York supplement, specifically about art in New York City. Do you find that New York is the place for this magazine? I above? hope so. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what, I, what I mean by this New York supplement, right. again, uh, whether it's New Yorker or uh, New York Magazine or Q, or, uh, they list the addresses and the events and the date they're taking place. They rather catalog and review them rather than actually being creative in themselves. No, no, they don't, they don't write about the event. They list it like a newspaper. You see, what I have in mind in the supplement is, uh, so to speak, now that you know where it's taking place, you know, uh, let's, let's figure out what happened. Let's find out what it was about. This, this dance, this poetry reading. Do you find film. a lot of people eager to contribute? Yeah, it's, it's uh, working out 
is it? Very well so far. Are, yeah. are you going to try to get it off when? Beginning of the year? Uh, hopefully. Hopefully end of December, possibly end of January. That really involves business oh. considerations in terms of organizing the right kind of advertising. And a lot of work. Oh, yeah. Now, I know at the same time you're writing a biography of Robert Scull, and we do want to get to that, but let's backtrack a little to your first work, which is Conversations with Jorge Luis Borges. Mm -hmm. You wrote this when you were an undergraduate? Yeah. Uh, Could you describe him to people who may not know him? Of course. He's well, <laughs> his literature. <laughs> let's, he's Argentine. Yeah. Um, at the risk of sounding melodramatic on your show, and uh, I, I would have to say that he is the uh, only human being I've ever known who I'm absolutely convinced is possessed by genius. Uh, it's a big statement. That's a you word he's used a lot, you know. But uh, I, um, I believe that, you know. And he's um, he's one of the foremost South American prose he's writers. He's one of the foremost prose writers. Period. And he's also a uh, uh, a poet, uh, an essayist. He's never written a novel, uh, but uh, he's written stories that are uh, absolutely astonishing. And uh, what attracts you so much to his work? Well, um, because the meaning of it has changed for me. You know, as uh, different periods of my life, and no doubt it will continue to. But um, I felt that he was writing about things that had never been uh, covered before such, such in the as. fiction terrain. <laughs> well, usually people are involved with, to a certain extent, social historical facticity, what I, that's what I call it. Uh, facts of life of a particular, in the broadest sense of the word, in a particular era and location. You mean uh, they, they write about reality on a more superficial or? Well, it doesn't have to be considered that way. You know, I think that every writer is after reality. They just have different approaches to it or the different aspects of reality that they're concerned with. But I, uh, what I mean by that is they were, and I suppose it still is, the school of New York Jewish writers who write, well, I, I mean by this Portnoy's complaint, what it means to be a, a sensitive, bright, Jewish boy growing up in a certain area. There are women's books about women's problems, divorce, so forth and so on. Black, feel, black books, you know what I mean? Yes, I do. You feel no. that he's more all-encompassing than that? Well, he, he chose to focus on uh, different matters, subjects which were generally excluded in uh, Western literature, uh, at least since the metaphysical poets, uh, like Dunn and Herbert. But he was doing it in a contemporary context. You see, uh, these aren't uh, hymns of praise to, to God, although they are metaphysical stories. They're stories that deal with time, memory, problems of identity, he, infinity. From reading your conversations with him, he's, he's immensely concerned with memory, and, and reality is based on memory. Is I he think not so. <laughs> he quoted his father as saying his father felt a tragic sense of loss, that a th an event happened to him in his childhood then perhaps that afternoon he remembered it. Then from then on, he felt that he was only remembering the latest memory of it, so that the event itself and the actual uh, reality of it receded exactly. and was changed and metamorphosed by his memory. That's right. Do you, no. do you, does Borges include this to a great extent in his literature? And do you, do you like the same in your writing? Are you attracted to the same? Well, I may not be attracted to the notion, but <laughs> that doesn't believe that I don't recognize the reality of it, right. you know. Uh, you he, see. He seems such a human man. Now, you met him yes. when he was how old? Uh, I think he was about 70, 71 years old. And almost you were blind. how old? I was 20. He was blind when you met him, wasn't he? Practically, not? completely, yeah. How did this blindness affect his writing? Did he describe his blindness to you and what it meant to him? Yeah. Uh, well, characteristically, he'd speak about it in a rather paradoxical way. Uh, on the one hand, he said that it made it impossible for him because the blindness was a gradual taking over of his uh, being. 
it never had good sight, but it made it uh, virtually impossible for him to write stories, which is, after all, his forte, his greatest strength as a writer. On the other hand, he talked about how uh, one experiences time differently when one is blind. One lives in a universe inside one's uh, mind more. And uh, that was something that kind of that uh, he interested used it, him. Did, uh, he used it then. He could study it almost uh, philosophically or objectively. Yeah, there's, there's virtually nothing in the world that he doesn't approach <laughs> philosophically, <laughs> which is something else that interests me because I think that uh, not many writers I'm thinking here of a line by Philip Robb in an essay uh, about American writers who are uh, obsessed with a cult of experience, with reporting down their actual concrete experiences of uh, everything from uh, losing their uh, virginity to making it in New York City or whatever. <laughs> and uh, at the expense, perhaps, of an ideational content, a content of ideas, that there isn't really a fusion between uh, idea and experience. And uh, Borges is very well read in philosophy, as well as mysticism, various religions, although he himself is a skeptic by. Is he? <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, I think that uh, this is one thing that made his. I think the world was ready for uh, this kind of sensibility, and that's why he had this success, you see, uh, to the extent that he that he did in this country. And you mean he's just beginning to have it because we are just now ready for him? No, I would say that he began to have it back in the 60s. You know, he was even a favorite writer among people who took uh, LSD and so forth. Uh, perhaps uh, liking him for the wrong reasons, but perhaps not, whatever. But uh, they felt uh, that he was writing about things that perhaps they had had experienced an altered form of consciousness or so forth. Because he was writing about infinity, not in an abstract way like a mathematical concept, but he was dramatizing it as something that really takes place in life and may in fact be a governing principle of life. And that's a very difficult thing to do. He was writing about this and yet he was a skeptic or was he, did he have his own set of... Well, uh, if you are not, uh, if I try to understand what you're getting at, uh, if you believe in a, in a God, and God is the embodiment of a kind of infinity, then I suppose uh, you can be obsessed with infinity, but you feel rather at ease about the whole matter because it's embodied in a single concept. Uh, you might work, work out some kind of thing, but like that. But you Had he even tried to work something out to satisfy himself, or he felt no need to? Well, I'm saying that you can recognize uh, infinity as a governing principle of life without necessarily and uh, knowing exactly what to do about it. <laughs> but he did you know? have, well, he obviously sensed If, if you don't have a religion right. to cut it down to size, right. you know. How did you find him just as a human being? Well, very, uh, very gentle, very modest uh, person. How did you interview him? Did you take notes or you did they it by tape recorder? They were taped. And uh, I wish I had had more time with him. The uh, fact is, I only had six hours, so I had to use... You them. only had six total hours for yeah. the entire book? Yeah, so I had to use almost everything. And um, what can I say? There are very few people who can talk a book, and uh, he did <laughs> talk literature. And see. make a book in six yeah, hours. Yeah, that's right. Which, which is what he did. It goes from <laughs> At his age, yeah. In your editing of it, or did you rearrange quite a bit? Mm -hmm. That was your yeah. job, more or less, to, yeah. to structure it. And you know, figure out what to ask him. And well, now so let's go to your book that you collaborated on with uh, mm -hmm. J. M. Alonso. Mm -hmm. Could you describe the, this structure because it's highly unusual? It's well, the first time I think I've read fiction with collaboration. Well, John Ashbery, as a matter of fact, wrote a book in collaboration, a piece of fiction. But it is un it is unusual. Although the notion of collaboration, I think, is is accepted uh, in other art forms. Uh, Certainly one thinks of jazz as a collaborative art, or cinema, or uh, theater. But uh, we've been conditioned to thinking that uh, fiction should be a lonely single enterprise, the In revelation a of one mind. Domain. Yeah. Did you find it frustrating to collaborate? No. Uh, At times, did you want to impose? <laughs> Tell us the structure of the book briefly. It's well, <laughs> it's. Uh, 
it's two writers um, talking back and forth, and a story emerges within a story. It's going to sound rather abstract as I describe it. Uh, but that's, that's the structure. It reads on, like a play of two characters, put it that way. The one is the central character, is he not? And the other, you'd call it supporting. In a supporting role, he simply defines what he saw as the outsider. One. Um, of the central Yeah, well, he invents himself. Up. He invents his own role in the story. It's like there was a story I conceived of, and then uh, Alonzo, who has the role of A in the book, invents his own part in terms of responding to this, and, he, and then he ultimately becomes a character in the other story. Did you at times try to get a, characters A and B, as you describe them in the book, to blend into one single character and then pull apart again? Was uh, in fact supposed to be two halves of one? Well, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so, but there are some ambiguous parts. And I, I felt it, it pulled together and then they drew away. You know what Bad Beckett says, human beings, uh, human souls, you will see how alike they are. <laughs> so I think that's inevitable. You know, when you read, uh, when you read Beckett, you feel that uh, in Waiting for Godot, for example, the characters are interchangeable. And in fact, Beckett's characters are so sh unsure of who they are that uh, if they ever exchange hats, they es essentially exchange uh, identities or roles. And, uh, Did you do this more or less consciously or unconsciously in this book? What do you mean? Uh, have your characters blend at times and pull apart? Maybe one or two times uh, consciously. Now, you, did you simply let the other author write his part? Did you write a section, then let him respond to it? Well, we helped each other. Sometimes I'd give him ideas and he'd put it in his own words. And uh, other times uh, he'd make suggestions about... Uh, it's, it's essentially a young like, man trying to... Uh, it's like uh, with, with Beatles songs, you know, people, people try to say, well, what's, what's Lennon, what's McCartney? What? <laughs> and they ask them that question. Sometimes uh, not, I not mean to compare myself to the greats of the world, but I mean, it's essentially the same uh, issue, you know. Did you, uh, didn't you at times feel that you wanted to take the whole thing and do it by yourself? Did you, don't, would you want to collaborate no. again? Uh, in answer to the first part of what you said, uh, I didn't feel that at the time. Would I want to collaborate again? Uh, in fiction? Well, if, <laughs> in the highly unlikely event that a Beckett or someone of that <laughs> stature uh, called on me, <laughs> I wouldn't say no. Uh, or, uh, Nabokov or something, but uh, I would say uh, outside of that, no. No, why? So, well, I've done it, you know, already, and uh, I've written, you know, I've published some stories in uh, various magazines, and I've, I've written um, a number of novels that were not published, and I think that's what my destiny is now, but uh, to uh, try to work out, you know, my so, own literary so life. So, do you think that a literary career as a fiction writer really isn't essentially a, a lonely or an alone, I should say, journey. I, yeah, and, uh, but I think that it really it applies to uh, almost everything. And, well, I, <laughs> I agree. suppose being no. president of the United States is a lonely <laughs> thing, too. I agree, but I mean, as, your, as an art form, you, you more or less become possessive about it and you want it to be yours. Yeah, that's true. Now, let's go to your book that you're just beginning, I believe, with Robert Skull. Mm -hmm. This is an authorized biography. That's right. What attracted mm -hmm. you? I know in the uh, Boston Arts Review you had an interview with him. Was mm -hmm. this the first time you'd met him? Yeah. Uh, no. no. <laughs> Actually, I, uh, I originally met him when I was, uh, he was a keynote speaker at Harvard on a, a symposium on art and the law. And I, I was writing for the Boston Globe column. and. Uh, I talked to him about um, what had happened there. He was kind of a controversial figure, and there, what were, had there were people there picketing him. And um, because he had made so much money off mm -hmm. of his art investments, bought artists' works for very little money, and and not let them share in the windfall profits. Although uh, I don't really know of anyone who has ever done that. <laughs> in other words, uh, if you buy some real estate, and suddenly oil is found on it, and your original investment of 2000 becomes worth 200000 
Are you expected to reimburse the person who sold you the land? No. <laughs> I, think, I think in the visual arts, though, are, are trying to catch up with the uh, dramatic arts and perhaps literary arts, where you do receive some sort of a royalty. Yeah. Well, but... They're you know. at least trying to. They and like he, to. Yeah, he's publicly, <laughs> he's publicly endorsed that um, position. But while it isn't law, no one's doing it. Right. And. Uh, well, he's rather a flamboyant man, isn't mm -hmm. he? In his own right, he <laughs> has a presence. He's slightly, would you call him theatrical in, in just his presence? I would. He was uh, dominating a room, perhaps, when he entered it. Yeah, I think that's I think that's true. He's a, he's a contradictory figure, and uh, I suppose he inspires ambivalence in some people, and they don't quite know what to make of him. How and are you getting to know him? Uh, how through do constantly going talking with him, as well as uh, reading everything about him and talking to people who know him. What kind of a book do you hope to write about him? As multifaceted as possible. Uh, well, it's not going to be a, a, a hymn of praise, uh, which is what people may generally think when they hear that something is authorized. Um, but uh, if you're writing a biography, you have to be, and you're dealing with a human life, you have to be, you know, rigorously, I think, uh, objective when you're dealing with, uh, you can't invent facts. However, if you have a, a kind of vision in mind, uh, you can create situations or scenes uh, to emphasize points that you're trying to get at. And uh, for example, when uh, the opening chapter is, uh, of the book is a, his celebrated auction at Park Burnett in Where? New York, which was the largest auction of contemporary American art. It set record prices for American artists, Jasper Johns, uh, painting went for $240,000, painting that he originally had bought for about $10,000. And uh, to me, that was uh, time becoming space for a kind of magical uh, moment. Uh, it was the 70s selling the 60s, <laughs> you know? And <laughs> yes, uh, the yes. 60s was over, and he has really been an integral part of the 60s, and all of that means with drugs and clothes and pop art and so forth. And um, so I think as a social dimension, uh, I, I think he's an interesting figure uh, in his own right. And may even say something about America, uh, because as uh, Mr. Skull is a highly successful businessman, and he's also obsessed with art. And that's bound to lead to contradictions whenever you have someone who's uh, devoting so much of his uh, concentration to, to big business on the one hand and the cultivation of beauty on the other, you see. Well, now, That's something that most people don't grapple with. It's one or the other. There was always a reactionary art movement who said that that, that entire movement itself of pop art mm -hmm. was, say, Madison Avenue manufacturing Madison Avenue and selling mm -hmm. it, and that it, in fact, was the academy of the day. And, mm -hmm. uh, big business in itself. So that in itself, that he was a part of that, would lend yeah. to but controversy in the art world. There's no question about uh, the fact that um, art movements, uh, certainly in, in the, the short time I've been alive, I don't want to make any <laughs> pretentious sweeping statements about all time, but I kind of suspect it's true, are, uh, but it's certainly true with the media the way it is, that everything is produced and sold to people, uh, of course. I can't uh, just like abstract expressionism. So expression that he's a wise. controversial figure among the artists, probably among business too. I would suspect. I, I'm not yeah. sure if I'm right. Um, I don't know if you saw the movie Nashville. No, I didn't. <laughs> but you you may have heard of it. It's a it's a fairly good movie. But anyway, um, Robert Altman said that Nashville was his metaphor of America. Well, to me, I see a lot of uh, the contradictions and uh, of American life in general, and New York art world in particular, embodied yeah, in Robert Skull and his Robert world. Skull. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, I hope to, to show that. <laughs> I <laughs> think you will. From reading your other work, I, I think you're a brilliant writer. Oh, please. <laughs> and 
I'd like to know when your book comes out, if you'd come back and be on our show again. And also, I'd be very happy to. let us know when the New York Arts Review its first edition is and come back then. My pleasure. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you very much. We've been talking to Richard Bergen. He's collaborated in the work of fiction with J.M. Alonso, the man with missing parts. He is the author and editor of Conversations with Orge, Luis Borges, and he's beginning the New York Arts Review and writing a biography on Robert Skull. Thank you again for coming. I'm Jesse Gray. The program is Books. Have a nice evening.